For the second, we have got two speakers together. So the first, okay, so Dr. Ryan Kelly and Melissa Rogerson from School of Computing, University of Melbourne, We're presenting on MECFS research in human computer interactions. Over to you. Do I just press the green one to advance? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Kelly from University of Melbourne, uh, joined by Dr. Melissa Rogerson here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit about two projects that involve um, technology design for self-management of MECFS. Before I get into that, I'll give you some background about myself and Melissa. Uh, we're both researchers in the Interaction Design Lab at the University of Melbourne, so we're interested in the design of technology broadly. We focus on user interfaces generally in our work, so the bit that people interact with when they try to uh, achieve their tasks in whichever domain we're looking at. And what we're interested in broadly is making technologies usable, useful, uh, enjoyable, depending on what the user's goal is, and we work on a very broad range of projects, everything from gaming through to health. Uh, and there are two ways we study technology generally. One is a very kind of technology-driven approach. You might think about something like virtual reality, augmented reality, augmented reality, all these kind of new uh, fancy technologies people like to uh, come up with. Here we look for uh, useful applications of these technologies. A different approach to technology design is actually by starting with the problem and doing something that we call user-centered design. So in other words, engaging with people, finding out about their lives, their needs, their problems, and designing technologies around those. So we don't say, right, we're going to pick virtual reality to solve this problem. We choose a technology based on their needs. And so what we generally do in this process is we start by identifying needs, so engaging with users, finding out about their lives, talking to them, and then designing something around that. And you can see on the slide that that's kind of cyclical. We might go back through that loop if we don't like what we've come up with, find out more about their problems, and eventually get to something that we're happy to prototype, evaluate, and then deploy, as opposed to simply just designing something and giving it to people in the hope that it will work. And there are plenty of cases uh, throughout history of uh, technologies that don't suit users' needs and ultimately fail. So to give some context to the projects that we're going to talk about here, this is the portal, the gateway to computer science research. It's what we use in our field to find literature uh, about human-computer interaction and various other aspects of computer science. What we're interested in is how much research has been done in our area on technology design for people living with MECFS. And the answer is not very much. If you look at this query here, chronic fatigue syndrome, you get one result from a database of about three million sources. Uh, and this one talks about something technical to do with chronic fatigue syndrome data sets. If we look at the long form of ME, you get no results. And then if you look at ME-CFS, you get one paper which talks about fixed cost flows and the covering Steiner problem. And we weren't sure what those things were, so we had a look. And they say, we prove a hardness result for the minimum edge cost flow problem M-E-C-F. So they've missed a letter. So in other words, M-E-C-F-S is entirely underrepresented in our literature and our field. Nobody has looked at support for this condition. And that's where uh, the research that I've done and the research Melissa's done comes in to address uh, this gap. Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about two projects. The first one is uh, what I will talk about. This is qualitative research on uh, existing practices of people who are living with MECFS and what they do in terms of technology use to enable self-management of their condition. This is in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Bath in the United Kingdom. I'm the third author on the paper that this, uh, the publication from this research is actually led by Tavi and Simon. Uh, and the paper is called Patient Perspectives on Self-Management Technologies for Chronic, Fati for Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, sorry. And it's published at the ACM conference on Computer Human Interaction, or CHI as we call it. In our field, conferences are actually the main publication venue. They're the equivalent of peer-reviewed journals. And this is the best conference in our field, so we're really happy to be able to talk about this research today. Um, it's not officially published, but the paper's available online as open access. So if you Google the title, you will find it. So the research uh, broadly addresses two questions. How do people currently use technology for self-management of MECFS? And what issues do they experience with those technologies? I'll talk about results uh, at a very high level from two of the studies in the paper. The first one uh, involved discussion groups, online discussion groups, uh, of current practices of using technology to uh, enable self-management. 
And what we did in this research was we initiated discussion threads in private groups uh, related to MECFS, invited people to contribute, tell their stories, and allow them to respond in their own time. So we're not scraping data or something from a public forum. We're doing it with people's consent, active participation in the research program, which is an element of user-centered design. And in that study, there are 52 individuals who took part, uh, responded across those three groups. And in the second one, uh, we did an exploratory study where we gave people existing self-management applications to use in their own time. Uh, these were Sleep to Peak, which is a fatigue monitoring application, Super Better, which is uh, intended to motivate activity or to help you manage and routinize your life, and Smiling Mind, which is a mindfulness application. And these were used uh, at least Everybody used one app, uh, some people used two apps, and all of those people came from the previous study. And the point of this study isn't to demonstrate that these apps are somehow good or effective for uh, self-management of MECFS. We're trying to learn about user needs, so we're not interested in clinical efficacy or any of those types of questions. We're interested in what elements of these apps are useful to people and uh, what elements cause problems for them. Uh, to give you a sense of the findings, one of the main things we found in this study is that people primarily use off-the-shelf tracking technologies like Fitbit, Apple Watch, uh, heart rate monitors to try to enable self-management practices. So there's a quote here from a participant who said, I found a heart rate monitor useful in helping me to find and stay within my energy window. So they're very interested in using things like step counts to identify a baseline level of activity and avoid uh, overexerting themselves and experiencing PEM. Interestingly, only one person in our study talked about using an app that was actually designed for MECFS, and this was an app called MECFS Diary, which is a scheduling app. Uh, so it allows you to record and plan tasks in 30-minute windows, but this person actually found that this app wasn't useful for her because 30 minutes was too long, that's too much activity, and she couldn't tailor the windows to the specifics of her condition. And the previous talk, uh, you spoke a lot about the need for uh, individual support, and that's very much echoed in our findings as well. There are two issues that we talk about as well uh, in terms of self-management with technology. One is related to the technology itself. A lot of these commercial trackers are not designed around the needs of MECFS uh, patients, people living with MECFS, and that's interesting to us as technology designers because what people are doing is actually appropriating the features. Uh, so here this person talks about how they use their step counter in reverse. It's to help me set a limit on the number of steps I take so I'm not suffering so much pain and fatigue the next day. Compared to everybody else, that 10,000 steps is usually a target, it's something to be pushed towards. Here it's actually a limit to be avoided. And what people wanted was condition-specific support, so technology is intended for MECFS, but also features that are very much tailorable to the individual. And they tended to appropriate different technologies to achieve those aims. So things like calendars, reminder applications on the phone were used to uh, enable activity pacing. The other thing I'll talk about briefly is um, the fact that living with MECFS makes it very difficult to uh, use technologies for self-management if those technologies aren't designed appropriately. Uh, so one of the things that became clear in the study is that the notion of effort, which is something we care about when we design user interfaces, is particularly acute uh, in this context. So if an app is very difficult to use or contains unnecessary steps, that could potentially exacerbate symptoms and make things worse. So this person talks about how when I record a migraine, my app will lead me to several different pages to annotate each and every little thing, but I simply want to go and lay down, so there are too many steps. The terminology that's used in these kind of apps must also be taken into account by designers. One of the apps that we used in the exploratory study had a label uh, called a lazy exercise uh, group of exercises. So the intention with that design is to try to give people easy exercises to do. But of course, for people living with MECFS, that's a very um, uh, uh, a label that has a lot of negative connotations around it, the word lazy. Uh, so that uh, label and that app deterred this person so much that they stopped using the app. Uh, and what we found through this study is that actually, because it's so difficult to uh, conduct self-management sometimes, there are opportunities for collaborative self-management. So engaging with one's partners or caregivers to um, uh, overcome some of these difficulties. So this person here talks about how she keeps in touch with her son during the day as he monitors my daily ups and downs. So there are opportunities to design technology to address that gap. So I'm going to hand over to Melissa now, who will talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Ryan. And I'm really kind of... I guess uh, honing in on this idea of collaborative self-management as well as something that's really crucial. So 
I'm talking about a project which was what we call a research through design project. When we do research through design, we design something with the goal of learning more about a situation or a condition through that process of designing and through inspecting our design at the end. So I'm going to show you some pictures of what we designed. This is not to suggest that it's something that we have built that, is, that we would expect even to put, put out there to release. Um, it's something that we designed to learn more about the use of technology in supporting people with um, MECFS. Um, the, the project was inspired by my personal experience as the parent and carer of a young woman with chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS. Um, she's been sick for about seven years now, so um, there's been a lot of learning for both of us. And we were also really inspired by Melinda Williams-Wilson's PhD thesis, which is very much, again, telling those stories of MECFS amongst young people and the way that it has affected their, their families. And our research question was, how can we design to support young people with MECFS and to support their carers as well? I did this research with Johanna Hagland and Mira Batra. Um, so some of the things that we started with was this idea of what technology does well. Okay, we want to leverage what technology does well to support people. We don't want to start trying to make technology do something that perhaps it's not well suited to. So I won't read through this list, but I will talk to some of these points as I go. So what we designed was a tool which we called My CFS Buddy. Okay, the idea was that this was like a little diary record keeping app that uh, young people could use when they were already using their phones. Okay, um, and we wanted to make it very, very simple. We had this little buddy who guided them through, uh, through the design, customizable, so they could choose, you know, their favourite cartoon character or the the vampire from Twilight if they really wanted to, um, so that they could feel that they had personalised the app in some way. The idea was that, actually I might just go back one step, when they open the app it asks them how they're feeling, okay, which is very, very simple, a simple face, you'll recognise those faces, um, but they also have an opportunity to leave themselves a, a note, a diary entry. But what, of course, technology lets us do is leave those entries using different modalities. So if they feel like typing something, they can. If they feel like saying something, they can. If they just want to take a selfie or take a photo of a lovely sunrise or sunset, that's also available to them. So we wanted to really make, make sure that they could do these things with minimal effort. These diary entries can be summarised on a calendar, which gives kind of a view of how someone was feeling on a particular day. Um, also, whether they have left themselves a note or a photo or an audio recording, and also an opportunity to star a note if they want to share that later with either their, their clinician or with a parent. I'm not quite sure why red, green, yellow is down the bottom there. Let's forget that. Um, the app can also then provide reporting functions. Now, we're not clinicians. We're not pretending to be clinicians. Um, we don't know whether the example data that we have put up there is going to be meaningful or not. What we wanted to demonstrate was that there is the potential to include lots of different types of data. So here we've got Chloe's mood, our sample patient, and then Chloe's mood compared to the weather perhaps might be something that we want to explore. And really leveraging that ability to pick up ambient information like weather conditions or location, um, her activity levels, her sleep, and then some information about what Chloe has chosen to share and what her parent has chosen to share. And this is then a report that can be sent to a clinician. One of the things that, that we find, I think, sometimes is that primacy effect, recency effect with memory. If you're going six months between appointments with your clinician, there's kind of five months there where no, which nobody really talks about. So this is a way to bring that perhaps to the forefront and remind, remind Chloe, remind her parent in this case of what was going on. 
We also thought that two-way permissions were really important. Okay, so Chloe is allowing her, her parent to see this information, but also the parent is allowing Chloe to see the information and being able to lock some of the messages so that perhaps the other person can't necessarily see that message or that diary entry might be important. In terms of the lessons that we learned through this process, I should say it is a throwaway prototype, but I do have a copy of it with me if anybody would like to have a look at it. I can show you on my laptop. Um, in terms of the lessons that we learned, the first one, and this might be obvious, but it, it was quite, quite powerful for us, is this idea that privacy is much more nuanced than we thought. So it's more than just who can see what. It's can parents share information with clinicians about a young person, somebody who's under 18, under 16, maybe under 14, um, or do we need the consent of the patient to do that? Similarly, can a child share information with their clinician or should that go through the parent? Um, what about medication and drug registers? You know, if you've got a child who's getting up at, at midnight and maybe taking a temazepam or taking a powerful drug, um, should they be keeping that private? Should that be recorded somewhere for sharing? So this ambient awareness of what's going on became important. And personalisation was obviously very important as well. In terms of designing for the condition, um, we felt that the multimedia options for data entry can help to reduce cognitive fatigue. The calendar view shares that ambient awareness of what's going on, even to the point of, is my child awake yet? You know, what's going on? And, and that became important when we thought about notifications. Because how do you send a notification to somebody who desperately needs to be able to rest when they can? Um, do we need to have some sort of sensing happening where if they're already using their phone, that's when we send them a notification? Or is that more intrusive? We also had this idea of don't be too engaging, right? We don't want to design an app that these, pe these young people want to use and get distracted by and spend all of their cognitive effort, all of their awake time in using. Um, it, it was meant to be something deliberately low key and simple. And obviously, I've put here clinician input is essential before we did any further design, um, but also input from patients, of course. So actually talking to more young people and going out and understanding that. And you know that was about the, the context of doing this study. Obviously, there are, there are detailed ethics processes that we would need to go through. So these are sort of the takeaways from me and Ryan. Um, we really think it's important to recognise that people living with MECFS are not isolated from technology and to then explore how we can tailor designs to the condition and to the individual. So again, very sort of similar, similar ideas there. Considering that whole ecosystem of care, that it's not just a patient, they have a family, they have carers, they have clinicians who are caring for them. And lastly, we just want to encourage more research in the technology space. You know, one, one paper in that database, is, it's embarrassing. And um, you know, if anybody is interested in partnering, we're certainly really keen to move this forward. So thank you. I've got a question. Um, as far as your initial research into what was available in this kind of design space, uh, there being nothing specific to MECFS, have you seen any more general kind of applicable apps or technology that might be useful in this setting? So within human-computer interaction, there is quite a lot of interest in self-management and self-management of medical conditions. Um, but I think, as Ryan said, a lot of it is about achieving a certain target rather than managing your energy to stay below a certain target. Yeah? And you can... I think uh, one of the things that's interesting uh, that's been brought to light in our field is that all conditions have particular uh, uh, needs that the technology needs to account for. So, for example, if we talk about HIV+, plus, an app designed for that needs to be uh, designed in such a way that privacy becomes uh, a key concern for the designer. And I'm thinking of a particular paper here. That paper showed that people who are, uh, who've been diagnosed or have got HIV+, plus, uh, are very conscious about that because of the stigma around uh, the condition. 
Um, there are apps on the App Store that are aimed at people with MUCFS. As far as I know, none of those apps have been evaluated. Uh, I don't know if there's ever been a content analysis on those apps. As I'm aware, there, as far as I'm aware, there isn't anything uh, to evaluate those apps. So there's certainly an opportunity to look at that more directly as well. Thank you. Just time to thank Raj and Melissa for a wonderful presentation.